Hi, I'm Ben Allison, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com, where people are learning bass despite sore muscles, creaky bones, and getting older. I have a very special guest this week. I've known him. I've known of him certainly for a long time. Ben Allison is a bass player, composer, orchestrator, longtime mainstay on the New York jazz scene associated with names like Lee Konitz, Peace Pipe, Medicine Wheel. He's a multiple downbeat critics poll winner, prolific band leader in his own right, having released a lot of records, including the brand new Healing Power, a beautiful tribute to Carla Blay. Hi, Ben. Hey, John. I can't believe the last interview we did on ForBassPlayersOnly.com was in 2011. Wow. We were both kids then, right? That's right. It's a whole yeah. different era. 2011. So anything new? <laughs> yeah, quite a few things new since then. But anyway, we're just we're, you know, I, I wanted to mention this new record is very much a collaboration um, between me and uh, guitarist Steve Cardenas and Ted Nash, saxophonist yes. Ted Nash. So we have this uh, very cooperative trio. This is our third record together, actually. Okay, um, I know you've, you've been together collaborating together for a long time. That instrumentation it seems to me that was inspired by jimmy jufri as kind of a nod to uh to jim hall did, did mm. i get that right close yeah that's pretty good i mean jimmy jufri had these, these drummerless trios in the right. 50s and 60s and they really um you know i just i've always been fascinated by his trios and that era i mean it just seemed like in a in a time where music was starting to get louder and louder. I mean, there were amplifiers, there was pop music, rock music, and even jazz um, started to get quite loud. They were going in the opposite direction. They were really getting quieter and quieter. And I think, you know, they were also kind of a product of what was happening in New York at the time. We had these kind of uh, prohibitive laws called the cabaret laws, which prevented drums uh, from, you know, prevented clubs from having drums in their club unless they had this highly sought after and impossible to get and totally corrupt uh, <laughs> cabaret license, you know, which most clubs didn't have and couldn't afford. So how long did that rule last? Um, believe it or not, the I never end heard of it. that law happened in 2018. I mean, it, it got eroded over the decades, thankfully. But music finds a way. I mean, that's the thing, the story of this is that musicians found a way through, for the most part, unless their cabaret cards were taken, which kind of kept, you know, Thelonious Monk and Billie Holiday and other jazz legends uh, without work for, for periods of time. But, but in general, musicians found a way. And one of the ways they found was to, um, was to work drummerless, you know, in, in duos and trios. So when I first came to New York in the 80s, um, that scene was very much active. I mean, it was most of the places around my neighborhood, Greenwich Village, many of them had piano-based duos or guitar-based duos. It was a lot of work for bass players, which was great. Yeah. And I got to hear, I mean, my first day in New York, I went one block down to hear um, Kenny Barron and Ron Carter play. Wow. And I'm talking about, you know, standing three feet away from them listening yep. at the bar. There's this little nook there, a little restaurant in our neighborhood, great place called Knickerbocker. Sure. And I remember Knickerbockers. And I used to go to the, the Vanguard and the gate. I'd see uh, McCoy Tyner and I'd see sure. Cedar Walton and uh, saw Mel Lewis when he had his Monday night gig with uh, Mel Lewis. Yeah, and Anchor, Ed. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was, those are great times. But I wanted to tell you that, that the record is very easy on the ears and now that you said you made a point of the, the drummer list, this is not a slight against drummers, but there was just something about it that was just so nice. And uh, I'm sure it would have been very nice if you had a drummer too, but that's not the concept you were going for. Yeah. I mean, it leaves leaving the drummer and I, you know, I'm a bass player. So bass and drums. I mean, we, uh, we, we have a love affair, <laughs> these two yeah, instruments. Yeah. They, they, we need each other, um, except when we don't. And this is like that one time in my uh, musical life where you know, I've, cho I've chosen to put a project together that specifically doesn't have drums. It leaves a lot of sonic room 
for the bass. And I, you know, I play acoustic bass, so there's a whole lot of energy down there, a lot of complex wavelengths going on. And um, without the drums, it just, you know, it just leaves more sonic room, honestly, for me. And that's, so I find myself um, playing differently in this group, approaching A little things. busier maybe than you normally would? Maybe, maybe I play more notes. Maybe I'm more soloistic, if I could use that word. I mean, we, this group, um, the nature of it is, it's, as I said, very collaborative, but it's also ve very egalitarian in the sense that we, we can each take the lead and we're, I don't find my role is just to play bass lines. I can play melodies. I can, yeah. I am the rhythm section. They're the rhythm section. The saxophonist is responsible for the groove. I mean, all of our roles are kind of intertwined and reversed and turned upside down, which is awesome. It just leaves a lot of space for creativity. Yeah. Well, so what inspired you guys to do this tribute to Carla Blake? Well, this is our third record. Um, the group started seven, eight years ago. I think I had a, um, an offer to play a concert upstate and thought, I mean, Steve Cardenas, the guitarist, and I um, had been working and have been working very steadily in various groups of mine over the years um, since then. And Ted Nash, I've known for 30 years. I mean, as a matter of fact, the very first tour I ever got called to do as a young bassist was with Ted. He called me up and asked me to play in his traveling quartet. So we, we did a lot of touring. So we were friends, but had never collaborated together and had never played in a trio setting. So it was just an idea I had. And, and out of that, we discovered our mutual love for and appreciation of uh, Jimmy Jufri. And also those, and Jim Hall was part of those early groups, you know, so Steve uh, is the biggest Jim Hall fan ever to live, probably, <laughs> not counting myself. And so we just started delving into that music. And out of that grew this idea of um, focusing on other people's music, because for the most part, we're band leaders in our own right and doing our own records with our own original music. But this is one place where we um, focus on other people's music, which is well, when you, really you great. look at Carla Blaze catalog of music, how did you decide which tunes you wanted to record for this record? Yeah, I mean, well, what's happened with this group, and it's happened quite organically is that we've each taken in turn uh, the role of kind of kind of leader. I mean, the first project, as I said, we, we recorded a record. Uh, first one was called Quiet Revolution. And because of our deal with the record label, it was released under my name. So we so the, but the next project we had in mind, Ted Nash suggested that we delve into the music of Leonard Bernstein. And it was the hundred, it was oh, the centennial. Right. Right. And so he wanted to do West Side Story and he had booked this tour of Cuba. So we got down to Cuba, which was really wow. fascinating and fun. And we did a tour down there where we played um, the music from West Side Story. And uh, it just went over great. I mean, audiences loved it. It's iconic music. It's a super challenging thing to distill it down to three musicians because yeah. it's very orchestral. Um, but we did and really enjoyed that. And so then now we're thinking, well, what's the third record? And it seemed to fall on Steve to pick because I had done one, Ted had done one. So Steve's up next and he picked Carla's music. I mean, he has a long affiliation with her um, having worked in Charlie Hayden's uh, Liberation Orchestra where she was pianist and arranger. And, um, you know, he, he wanted to do it. He suggested Carla's music met zero opposition from Ted or I, because we're both huge fans of hers, of course. And so Steve picked the tunes. And I think what he tried to do was pick tunes that represent different eras in her musical development from like the late fifties through the eighties. I love it all, but there's one tune in particular called lawns. Mm. That I just, that's got that haunting melody. I just love it. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, that's um, we've had kind of a, I could say almost a minor hit on, on the streaming services with that tune. It's getting a lot of play, which I'm not surprised. It's it's, you know, I guess it's about as close to a pop tune as Carla would have written. It's got, in in the sense that it is, um, has a lot of elements that I consider central to pop music, namely that it's a beautiful, memorable, simple, yet deep i mean it, it it's a simple melody but you just want to hear it many times and i mean to me that's kind of the a defining characteristic of good pop music it's somehow simple in a way 
not yeah. simple to write, but simple in its formation in some ways, but makes you want to listen to it a lot. And this, that tune has it for sure. For sure. You mentioned Charlie Hayden. I, I had the privilege of interviewing him a few years back and it was wonderful. I saw that interview. It's great. Phone interview. Yeah. It must have been a long time ago. Uh, would, would you consider him one of your influences? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, he was one of my first and largest influences, so much so that I remember walking into a jazz club in the West Village in my mid-20s and somebody yelled out something about me, like, oh, there goes Ben Hayden or something like that. And the joke was that I was starting to sound a whole lot like Charlie Hayden. Okay. And I took that to heart. It kind of pissed me off, honestly. But I went home and decided, you know, I better stop listening to Charlie for a few years because... It's I'm channeling him just a little too much. That's how much his music meant to me. I mean, it really, you know, impacted me deeply. And I started kind of sounding, emulating him and, or doing my attempt at emulating him. You can't, but I, I absorbed a lot. And nice. uh, so for sure, he's a, he's a, an early and important influence for me. Trying to remember where I saw him. It was at one of those conventions. Do you remember the International Association of Jazz Educators? Oh, yeah. Oh, he was there at one of the conventions and I got to see him. That was very special. Are you guys planning on doing any touring to promote the record? We have some tours coming up. I mean, some little, you know, little performances here and there, sporadic is what I mean. We find time to do it whenever we can in between our other our other projects. As a matter of fact, we're going to record our fourth album this October. Talk to uh, me. Yeah, it's a, so I guess it's come around and now it's back to me to pick the, the repertoire. And I want to dive back into Herbie Nichols' music. Um, that's a, Herbie Nichols is a genius pianist and composer, I think, uh, tragically under-recognized in his own lifetime and really even since. Um, but uh, some years ago, I mentioned Frank Kimbrough before, dear yeah colleague who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but he and I had um, delved heavily into Herbie Nichols music back in the 90s and early 2000s and recorded three albums. But um, since then, we haven't really dealt so much with that music until we came across um, a bunch of unrecorded compositions of his, things that he himself never recorded That'll and, be very never, special. and have never been heard, as a matter of fact, because... Um, they were uh, lost for decades, these tunes, and we uncovered them. A, a relative, a distant relative got in touch um, to let us know that, that he had them. So we, we got the copies of the, the sheet music and wrote it all out, and we're going to go in and record a bunch of those in October. That sounds like a very special project. Yeah, it's going to be it, great. It's incredible music. You have done some awfully interesting things in your musical career, Ben, collaborating with musicians who play all sorts of different instruments, some of them I've never heard of. Everything from chora, cello, oud, synthesizer, alto flute, violin, bass clarinet, kumbas, saranji, banjo, theremin, nigoni, balafone, and slide trumpet. So what's percolating <laughs> now in your musical mind? What's next? Uh, other than the, the trio project that you mentioned, what else is next for Ben Allison? Well, when you put that whole list together in one sentence, it does sound kind of... Um, so next for me, well, this, this trio record, um, I had a record come out um, last fall called Moments Inside, which we've been, that, that particular group is a two, two guitarists, two great guitarists, um, Steve again, and another guitarist, Chico Pinheiro, who's originally from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, but has been in New York for about 10 years. Um, and me and a great drummer, Alan Mednard. So we've been playing and, and, um, and touring and trying to work up some new music around that. So I think I'll be hopefully going into the studio with some new music next spring. So I'm kind of in writing, thinking about the idea of possibly thinking about writing some new music for that. Um, I also spent a good portion of the pandemic since touring had stopped and recording had stopped. I spent a good portion looking back at my older catalog. Right. I, I was, um, I, I made was some records. I the other day. 
Right. So I made 10 records for this great independent label called Palmetto Records. I, um, the de my deal with them was that I owned all the recordings, but I licensed them. And so those have uh, You're now- You're a smart businessman. Well, you know, <laughs> actually, Andrew Hill taught me that early oh. on. Well, yeah. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Yeah, he's one of my idols and, and I guess mentors because he he talked me into never selling my music to anybody. Wow. So I, I license it. But the point of the story is, is that I, I took the time to, to delve back into those older records and um, take them apart. Or I, I got the original uh, master tapes back, the, the multi-track tapes, and uh, decided to remix a bunch of them and just kind of build them back up again from, from scratch, essentially, which was really, really fun. I mean, it, it was, it's interesting. I don't know. You, I guess you hit a certain stage in your life. I'm middle-aged now, very middle-aged, super middle-aged, um, where I can look back on a, on a career of on, uh, quite a few albums. And when you're listening to the master tapes, one of the most interesting things is hearing the, the banter us talking in between takes and kind of what we're talking about and how we're working. And, uh, you know, what, what became apparent was that first of all, we were having a whole lot of fun making these records because there's a lot of laughter and a lot of joking around, but at the same time, you know, we were all very intent on making this, you know, the best records we could make. And, um, so that was very cool to hear. And as I was piecing them together, I also started finding uh, things that, I, that weren't on the original releases. I mean, sometimes, it sounds silly, but sometimes even realizing that we forgot to unmute a track when we went to mix it that was there. And we're like, oh, crap, there's like a Frank takes a Wurlitzer solo on that, on that tune. I forgot he did that. And so I, I put some stuff back in. But more than that, I, I um, mixed it in a way that I think brings a little bit closer to what my original intention with the music was. Um, and the only reason the original recordings sound great, but we did them quickly because that's, you know, that's how we did it. And we did it manually. We didn't have uh, automation. So a lot of these yeah. records, we just mixed, you know, 20 fingers at a time, just, uh, and we'd do a take and that would, that would be it. That's what would be on the record. So now I could go back and be a little bit more thoughtful and get everything placed just the way I want. Oh, good. So that's what I did. So those those records, um, I'm releasing five this starting this fall, starting in September, September 13th. And then I'm going to release one a month. Wow. Um, October, November, December, January. Pretty ambitious. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're all done. I mean, I, that's, yeah. I told you that's what I spent my pandemic to. Yeah remixing these albums i'm just putting the finishing touches on them and um i'm just going to release them you know digitally um obviously all the streaming services and, and stuff but also um for those audio files out there the 24-bit flax you know if you're into such stuff which quite a few people are um that'll be via my website benallison.com great tell me about your your base and your or bases gear strings effects you know amps do, do you, you play with a pickup through an amp or are you like an ultra purist you know <laughs> yeah um it didn't occur I mean, to I, me till i started asking the question i might be touching a nerve i i don't know no no, no no i mean i definitely use a pickup um not always but sometimes it's really kind of necessary i mean you know it depends kind on the pickup, style yeah. of music and my music my personal music has a wide stylistic range, but also the kind of music I find myself playing with other creative musicians on the scene. It's, you know, it's all over the map stylistically. So sure. yeah, I mean, I, I mostly play acoustic bass and I do have a pickup on it that I use when necessary. What you kind know. of pickup? I'm um, the realist. David it's Gage. Of, yeah. I mean, it's one of the original ones, it's like, you know, it's basically almost a prototype because I was one of the early beta testers of the, uh, that thing. And uh, yeah, so I have, um, I have that on there. And then I use uh, sometimes um, an audio technica a condenser mic that I kind of clip on the bridge, which I like the sound of um, when I'm playing live. Uh, in the studio, obviously, I use the best mics that they have. Sure. But on the road, you know, usually a combination of that and then whatever the 
amp they're able to to backline. I mean, I have my preferences, but it kind of depends on the room and you know. Tell me about your bass. It's a Prescott. I got this about twenty years ago, and um, I've always been. I was always a fan of Prescott basses. These these are made in in uh, New Hampshire. This one, they I think around eighteen forty. Wow, it's a seven eight size, so it's a pretty good chunky size bass. Um, I heard it first because Scott LaFaro had one. That's where I remember reading somewhere that he had one. It turns out he had a much smaller version of this. This is what they called a church bass. And I think it was kind of their middle of the line, like not their top of the line bass, but uh, big nice. and full and designed to fill up a church. <laughs> hey, you said something a few minutes ago that got my attention. Um, you said you play acoustic bass mostly or almost exclusively. So does that imply that you play some electric bass too? I do. I started, I started playing electric bass again about five, six years ago. And it was, it was again, through necessity. I, I was um, going to play a, a, a concert in the Philippines, and there was just no, first of all, there was no way to bring a bass there. Secondly, there are no basses there because it's just like 100% humidity where we were going, very tropical. Yeah. So basses would just blow apart. I mean, you can't keep one together. Um, and so I, but I really wanted to do the gig and it paid great. So I said, well, well, let me, can I bring an electric? Sure. So I brought that and kind of worked my way through it. it sounded cool. It was fun. And then I started to kind of get into it. And, um, you know, this was at a, at a resort where we had about 11 days. We basically just played at night. Um, and I had the days free and I just started kind of working out on it and shedding and trying to get some stuff together and, realized that I really enjoyed it. And then it became a process of trying to find my voice on it, which I still haven't quite found. Um, like I have on the acoustic where I know what I sound like on the electric. I'm not sure exactly where I sound like yet, but I started writing music that featured, you know, that were called on me to play electric writing tunes on the electric bass, things that I couldn't do on acoustic or that just sound pretty good on electric and incorporating that into my own music. So that's okay. been fun. I'm trying to imagine your music with the electric bass, but you also said fooling around. So I'm wondering if, if there were any uh, influences from James Jamerson or Jocko or Jerry Jamad or, uh, you know, sure. anybody. So what, what, where do you stand as far as that goes with electric bass? What would you well, gravitate if you wanna, to? If, if you want to hear my, my latest record moments inside, it's the first two tunes on the record I play electric on. And then a, a tune or two later in the album. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always been a fan of um, electric bass and electric bass players, especially since I'm a, a big fan of R&B and, and funk and soul. And, and uh, obviously Jocko in high school, the first time I heard Jocko melted my brain, yeah. you know, and um, but also people like, Willie Weeks and Chuck Rainey and people that just have beautiful sounds that are on just like a gazillion records. And all of a sudden yeah. you're hearing them and you're like, well, who's that? Oh, Chuck Rainey again. Yeah. It's him again. He's still on. And it's like, you know, um, you, you start to, if you're a bass player, you start to go down those, those uh, exploratory rabbit holes where you're, where you're trying to listen to everything that they did and, and appreciate kind of this, the breadth and scope of their contribution to music. So you just check out just Chuck Rainey and that'll give you a, a life's worth of stuff to listen to and to absorb. Yeah. And so I've always been a fan of those guys and they're playing. And I think maybe, and I've been told by other people, so I, I don't think I'm hallucinating, have channeled some of that in my acoustic playing. So I do tend to sometimes play styles or s types of, ways of sounding and, and playing in my acoustic uh, bass playing that references those kind of R&B players and that, that sound. I want to ask you about playing bass and learning bass, because we've got more and more people coming to forbassplayersonly.com every day to learn how to play bass. Yeah. And most of them tend to be men 
in their 50s, 60s, 70s. <laughs> They're not trying to be rock stars or have a career in music. They've always wanted to play the bass. Maybe they've dabbled in it, but didn't get very far, or they're just taking it up for the first time. So they just want to get together with their friends. They want to play some classic rock riffs or some blues shuffles, maybe some walking bass. So mm -hmm. in, in that context, what advice do you have for somebody like that who wants to learn bass? What do you think they should be paying attention to? It's a hard one to answer because, you know, everybody's different and everyone has different desires and also kind of different places where they're at in terms of their musical uh, journeys. But my general vibe is to try to think about music first and bass playing second. And what I mean by that is I think sometimes, and this is a, this is a big ask, I know, because I've devoted my life to, to, to music and bass and most people have real jobs, but let's say um, you find the time in your life to carve out to really to really practice and kind of get it together. I think it's it's more important to work on your musicality um, rather than let's say just learning a bass line that someone else played on a record. I mean that can be a kind of an interesting way to maybe learn a little bit about the the lexicon of the music and kind of maybe understand how these uh, parts you know, kind of work together, I guess. But really what's more important is that you have um, a, a deep sense of musicality so that you can make up your own bass lines. And you do that by uh, getting a fundamental grasp on basic harmony. I mean, luckily, if you're playing most rock, pop, RB, soul, salsa, you know, any other musics that have, have uh, important bass lines, um, usually it's fairly simple harmonically. I mean, you're not going to be playing, you know, Nefertiti or Fee Fi Fo Fum or anything right out right off the bat, right? You're going to be playing tunes that have some kind of standard chord progression. So getting a good sense of, of what's happening harmonically, understanding how traditional harmony works so that you can connect those chords, you know, and play those roots and kind of uh, understand the voice leading and how harmony tends to move. You'll recognize there's a lot of repeated things in, in popular music. I mean, there's yeah. inventions. Um, and so when you, when you uh, do a little bit of that work to kind of prep yourself and get a little bit of understanding of, of basic harmony, um, then you can start making up your own bass lines and you can reference all the stuff that you've heard, but you're, you're not just locked into learning these specific notes in this specific order. It frees you up to be more of a musician. And that's the way musicians feel. I mean, they, they may make up really cool bass lines. They may improvise them. They may write them. They may read them. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, 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 um, it's all just music. So that's, that would be my advice is to delve a little bit into the harmony. Uh, just don't start with the Steely Dan stuff. That's not a good, yeah. <laughs> good place to start. Start with the Beatles or Chuck Berry or something like that. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, if you, if you listen to any kind of doo-wop era, 50s era pop music, it's, it's, it's just the one chord to the six chord to the two chord to the five chord. It's yep. the same chord changes on every single tune. Yeah. So once you start to get that, and maybe you go to the four chord and yeah. if you're really hip, you go to the flat, you know, the flat seven chord down, down a whole step from the root yep. and back up. And those right. are, those are kind of your standard chord progressions in, in a lot of tunes. And you also, if you play those and you start listening to them, you start to be able to recognize them and how they sound. You're like, Oh, yep. that one again. And then you're able to pick out. So you can, you know, you can also hear a lot about how this music came together, how it's put together. And that can inform your, your playing. So you're not just locked into a specific bass line per se. Hey, Ben, what would you be if you weren't a bass player, something outside of music? <laughs> That's tough. Outside of music. Yeah. Some people say a drummer, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I guess like, my hobbies, if, if I have any, tend to uh, kind of lean towards the science side of things. So I do love science. I love reading about it um, from, from a, you know, kind of a novice uh, amateur standpoint, reading scientific books and sometimes 
uh, technical stuff, but mostly um, theoretical. So I, I don't know, maybe something in the sciences. I don't know if I would have had the, the, the patience or the passion to devote myself to one particular field because science tends to get very uh, specialized, like super, even more than medicine. I mean, it's like super specialized, yeah. Yeah. but maybe, you know, maybe something like that. Okay. I, I did ask you that question in 2011, but because oh, it was so I long think? ago, I thought I'd ask you again to see how you would answer. Oh, yeah. And you, you gave me pretty much the same answer. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the word science. Okay. Well, it's so great catching up with you. Let's not wait another 11 years before we do it again. Yeah, and man. Let's if, not. If you come through Michigan with, with uh, the, the guys or with anyone else, let me know. I would love to see you in person. Right on. Likewise. Great. Congratulations on the new record. It's called Healing Power. Beautiful, beautiful tribute to Carla Blay. And also watch for Ben's release of the first, would you say, 10 albums that you did? Five. It'll be five this fall, starting uh, September 13th. Five of the 10, right? Five so, of the 10. Uh, so, yeah, I'm starting oh, there. Okay. Okay, you'll, you'll probably get to the other five eventually. But anyway, lots of stuff going on. Congratulations again. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman of ForBassPlayersOnly.com, where people are learning bass despite sore muscles, creaky bones, and getting older. Thanks again to our special guest, Ben Allison. I will see you all next week. Let's play bass.